Amen. Thank you so much, music team. Thank you all for joining uh, along and raising your voices uh, to the Lord. It's uh, fun to continue our, our trek here through the life of Christ, and we'll be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19 this morning. Zig Ziglar, you heard of Zig Ziglar? If you're old enough, you have. And, uh, he married uh, his high school sweetheart at 19 years of age. Uh, he became a motivational speaker and taught at uh, many uh, seminars for salesmen, helping them to improve their communication skills as, pure, as poor communication always results in a loss of sales. Zig was a Baptist, and he often interjected his Christian faith during uh, speaking engagements and sometimes uh, told this joke about communication difficulties. Let's see if you can identify with it and not get in a fight over it at lunch. It starts like this. (laughs) A woman meets with an attorney and says, I want to divorce my husband. Okay, the attorney responds, let's start with a few questions first. Like what? She asks. Well, do you have any grounds? Yes, she responded. We have about five acres out in the country. The attorney, no. I mean, do you have a grudge? Thinking he said garage, the woman said, no, we don't, but we do have a nice wide carport and a storage shed. Perplexed, the attorney responded, let me ask this a little bit differently. Do you have any complaints about him? Like what, she said. Well, like, does he beat you up? No, she responded, I'm up at least an hour before him every day. Exasperated, the attorney finally asked, why exactly do you want to get a divorce? Well, she replied, the guy just cannot communicate. I won't won't blame all women or all men for that. I, I think we're all... Uh, We all can laugh at that just a little bit, can't we, as we identify with it? We should. But we do so knowing all too well that we too at times are just as guilty of thinking and hearing one thing while the complete opposite is being said or being trying to to, to being communicated to us, proving, proving exactly that the state of our thinking often overrides what is actually being said. And certainly there has never been another person more misunderstood than our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about this uh, concerning Jesus? How is it that some of the same crowd rejoicing and crying out on Palm Sunday, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the Son of David, come Friday, cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Could it be that their thinking could have been overridden uh, and what Jesus had been saying all along, they were hearing something completely different? Did they think that he had come to overthrow Rome when he, in fact, as the eternal son of David, needed first to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures about his death? Well, but I would argue so in today's study found in Matthew 5, 17 through 19 is just another example of how Jesus was misunderstood even by those closest to him, his disciples. I have uh, maybe struggled, I, I can confess, with this particular sermon more than any sermon in five years that I have preached uh, in this place. The text is very familiar to us. We have no doubt read it tens, if not hundreds of times as we're rolling through the Sermon on the Mount, and, and it seems to kind of make sense, but I don't know, if you ever have slowed down and begin to ask questions of the text, you're going to find that it's extremely complex in its, in its nature. And like many hinge texts or, 
We're like, even in, in the study of homiletics, the study of preaching the Word of God, they say the, the, different, the most difficult thing that you have to do is, is kind of create a bridge from what's being said here to, to what's going to be said here. And it becomes somewhat of a, we call it a hinge point, right, where, where there's a shift in, in what is being said. And, and this is what's going on here in Jesus' sermon. There has been the Beatitudes given, and then it, it, right at the center of the body, between the body and that beginning, is this hinge set of text, and it is full of wisdom, yet full of a lot of traps. <laughs> you're visiting Capital City Church this morning, and you're joining us as we journey through the four Gospels in a study of the life and the ministry of Christ. We have arrived at the preaching of the Sermon on the Mount. In getting here, we have studied, remember, the birth of Christ the boyhood of Christ, the ministry of John the Baptist, the early Judean ministry of Jesus found in John chapters 1 through 4, and we're now in what is referred to as the great Galilean ministry of Jesus. Jesus at this point in, in junction and in time is less than two years from going to the cross, and so that's kind of where we stand. In this study, in the great Galilean ministry, we have seen that Jesus enjoyed, albeit for a very short time, favor with the religious class and the common people. Nevertheless, after Jesus began to break the religious traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees, namely their Sabbath day traditions, the scribes and the Pharisees are now committed to killing Jesus and the tension begins to rise inside of our text. In light of this, Jesus is recorded as going up a mountain, spending all night in prayer, choosing 12 men to be with him, to send them out to preach and to have authority over the demons. After doing this, he came down to a level place on that mountain and, and he sat down and he began to focus on his disciples and he began the Sermon on the Mount. In striking fashion, Jesus opened his teaching with the Beatitudes. And rather than teach his disciples what they had been taught their whole lives, that is that if you are Jewish and that if you follow the commands of the Old Testament, you'll enter the kingdom of heaven, he, he begins to describe actually what a life looks like on here on earth of those who will enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and already in their minds in this introduction to his sermon, they're like, whoa, wait a second. Pause. <laughs> That's not what we're used to hearing these kind of people make it in? Shouldn't Jesus have just said, if you're a Jew and a, a son of Abraham, welcome to the kingdom? But he does not. It's those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn over sin, those who are gentle, who hunger and thirst for right living, and who are merciful in the here and now, and are pure in heart in the here and now. It's those people, like those peacemakers, they will be the ones who inherit the kingdom of heaven. Time escapes us to rehash each of those characteristics that describe a citizen of heaven who is living here on earth. But suffice it to say that the Beatitudes did not describe the lives of the scribes and the Pharisees at all. As is always the case with mankind and religion, they had replaced the word of God with their traditions. They were counterfeits, representing a counterfeit path to the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus was going to set it all straight. So in turning to Matthew 5, 17 through 19, uh, Jesus, knowing that his disciples would be tempted to think he was abolishing the Old Testament, teaches them, teaches them that he comes rather to fulfill it. Oh, if you've been around me often, not in the pulpit, but maybe behind the scenes, I will sometimes say that in the academy and in teaching and in seminary, you get to learn a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things that go on inside the text. And we study hermeneutics and homiletics and how is it that we're going to find the point of the text and or even should you find the point of the text? Is it, is it just a free-for-all we get to do with whatever, uh, whatever we want with the text? And uh, so, so often, good thinkers will come to difficult sections of the text, and they'll acknowledge that there are very different thoughts, and there are in this particular text, about what is being said in the text. And I will always say in those behind-door meetings, or if we're sitting around a dinner table, that your seminary professors will say something like this, well, I have friends that are on both sides of this argument, 
and I agree with my friends. You see that? <laughs> Are you tracking? In this particular case, there's about 10 different friend groups that could all be right. And at some level from the pulpit, it's a little hard to just go over 10 different things that are going on. You, you have to ask yourself and you have to preach, what is it that you believe God is saying here? And that's what I've done today, and I'll do the best that I can, can to communicate to you, not the word grudge or garage, but what is being said here in the text. Look there at verse 17. Jesus unequivocally says to his disciples, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. So, Beloved, like that woman speaking to the attorney who had heard grudge and not garage, Jesus recognizes the blindness of preconceived thoughts and moves to clarify after giving the Beatitudes, do not think. In other words, pay attention, <laughs> listen. Do not, it's moved to the front there, is emphatically in the Greek, so, so it gets our attention. Do not think, I, I, I said grudge, not garage. And what were the disciples not to think? That Jesus had come to abolish the Old Testament. Behind our English word to abolish or to destroy, depending on your translation there, is the Greek word kataluo. And kataluo is used different, uh, differently and in different ways throughout the New Testament. But here it means to destroy, it means to demolish, to overthrow, to tear something down. So you might write these synonyms in the margin of your Bible. Jesus is saying to his disciples, do not think that I came to destroy, do not think that I came to demolish, to overthrow, to abolish, or to tear down the law or the prophets. In other words, Jesus says he did not come to destroy everything that falls between the world's creation recorded in Genesis and the last Old Testament prophet, uh, Malachi, who will then speak of the last prophet who we know as John the Baptist. Now, I don't want to belabor this too much, but it's so necessary to find some application for us uh, in this text and uh, otherwise, it's going to feel a lot, and it probably will feel a lot like this, more of a teaching than a preaching. But there are some things to be aware of and things to be careful of as we think carefully about the Lord and this hinge moment in history where the old covenant is being fulfilled and the new covenant is being established. And here we are at the, the very hinge point of those two things. So let's think about this. Some very influential pastors and theologians of our day, either by their statements or their theology or both, have done this very thing. They have destroyed the Old Testament. Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son, has been making many waves over the last decade by telling people to unhitch from the Old Testament and that people do not need to believe in its historicity in order to be a Christian. So hear what he's saying. It's mostly driven by and maybe some kind of honorable thing inside of him where he's, he's, he's wanting to reach people who are a little bit offended by what's said in the Old Testament. And he's trying to create a little bit of division there and, and essentially ask in podcasts and other things that he has written. He's saying that, that you don't, you don't, to be, in order to be a Christian, you don't have to accept everything that is written in your Old Testament. It may or may not be true. It may or may not be historical. What we do know about is Jesus, and that's Andy's point. And if there's any honorable thing in that, it's that there is a desire to reach people. And if you're in the know and you're paying attention to Andy Stanley right now, you're going to know that he just had a conference for the LGBTQ community, inviting them to the church, saying, don't worry about that Old Testament. It's all about Jesus. There's some truth in that. That it's about Jesus, that is. In addition to Stanley, there is a sect of independent fundamental Baptists, along with others who identify as Pauline dispensationalists. Have you ever met one? I have a family member who is just rabidly down this path. Just extreme dispensationalism, they'll call it. Nothing, you, 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 can, you can take your Bible and you can turn to the to the 12 or 13, depending on how you view Hebrews, and you can take everything out of it, just tear it out and throw it away. 
The only thing that matters is, is that the, the Pauline epistles written to the Gentiles, you know, you and me. <laughs> just get rid of that thing. Just unhitch from it. Just forget that there's, there's anything in there of any value. These believe that rightly dividing the word of truth means that the only scriptures a Christian needs to pay attention to are the epistles of Paul. So in effect, although these two influencers would likely uh, not get along whatsoever, they both go astray in their theology and their practice because they have unhitched themselves from the Old Testament. Beloved, what would gender be without Genesis? Think about that. (laughs) What would sin be And who would it affect? And there would be no promise of God that he would even fix that sin because we wouldn't know what it is. What would marriage be without the book of Genesis? How would we explain a catastrophic event in the geologic record that killed life on earth? Who would be the Jews? Who would even care about that little chunk of land that is being fought over for thousands of years because none of it would exist? without your Old Testament. None of it. To unhitch, to forget, to to not pay attention to, to, to its teachings, its promises, all of that leaves you with a Jesus who has no history, with Jews who mean nothing, with a God who, who didn't say he would curse the earth if sin were to come in. Why would we even need forgiveness of sin? There is no sin in a world without Genesis. And beloved, I don't know if you're paying attention, but Look around the world who has unhitched themselves from the Scriptures. <laughs> what are they saying? What is gender? Who is God? What is sin? Why would I need forgiveness? What a tricky thing the devil's done, right? To try and get us to detach, to unhitch, to destroy what the Word of God says from Genesis through Malachi. So it is, beloved, as we return to thinking about our text, Jesus understood his teaching would tempt his disciples to think he was abolishing or destroying the Old Testament. However, he rejected that thought very firmly, as we can see there in the text, and he affirmed that he came not to destroy it, but rather to fulfill it. And this is where it begins to start to, to get just a little muddy, right, in your minds. Now, wait a second. Doesn't fulfill mean put an end to? <laughs> Isn't there some sense of, of coming to its completion, meaning that something in the past is, is no longer valuable? And we begin in our minds to go, now, wait a second. What is that? So let's dig into that for a minute. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish or destroy, but to fulfill. The Greek word behind our English word fulfill is the word plerao. Matthew uses that very word 17 times in his gospel, and it's important to note that he uses it at least four different ways. You'll remember back in Matthew 2 when we discussed this here now months ago as we were getting into this study. In chapter 3, verse 15, Matthew uses fulfill uh, with the sense of making something happen. In chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, he uses fulfill to correspond an event in Israel's history to an event in Jesus' life. And you can begin to see it's used in different ways. We do the same thing in English. I'll never forget the first hermeneutics class that I was taking. The, The pastor who was teaching me said, write down the word trunk. Now, what does that word mean, and how many different t- contexts can it mean different things? And, and the students in the room, they would write down, well, it could mean the trunk of an elephant. I guess the context would have to tell me that we're talking about elephants. And then I would think trunk. If uh, we were talking about uh, throwing some groceries in your car and you use the word trunk, you would probably think the trunk uh, was the place that you popped open, right, and threw your groceries in. And so what is my point? And when we come to fulfill, when we come to any word study, when it comes to the New Testament, it's so easy for us to just say, oh, well, it means this. Well, you have to pause for a second and ask, does it mean that in the context? And so first, he uses it in the sense of making something happen. Second, he uses it twice to correspond with an event in Israel's history in Jesus' life. 
In chapters 13, verse 23, Matthew uses fulfill in a way that implies a fuller knowledge, like having a glass that's three quarters full of water standing or sitting in your lap, and you're in the in the in uh, somebody comes along with a pitcher and they they say, "Would you would you like me to fill that?" and they fill it up, and and that's a way that Matthew uses fulfill. It's not it's not. Uh, uh, it's, it's for us to understand, yes, there was something there, and now there is more knowledge. It's fuller. It, I understand it better. Matthew uses the word that way. Those five instances, Mark, Matthew, uh, Mark, uh, times where Matthew uses play ra'o or fulfill differently than what is intended here in our text. Twelve times in Matthew's gospel, including this one, the word is a literal accomplishment of an Old Testament prophecy. And that's kind of generally what we think about the word, right? Well, fulfill means something was said, now it's done. Praise the Lord. In this case, that's how Matthew is using it, all right? Uh, In other words, God has prophesied something in the past and is being fulfilled in the present tense. Alfred Edersheim, who wrote a wonderful book titled The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, Uh, found 456 Old Testament prophecies referring to the Messiah or his times. And he noted conservatively that Jesus fulfilled at least 300 of those in his earthly ministry in his first advent. Now, beloved, the chances of one man fulfilling specific prophecy to the tune of 300 is a number so large that our minds cannot at all conceive it. I could tell you it, and you just kind of, it's kind of like, talking about our nation's debt. This sounds like a lot, right? Only it's more than that. Let me help us for just a second. The United States of America is 33 trillion in debt. That is the number number 33 with 12 zeros behind it. Does anyone's bank account look like that? Because I want to be your friend. (laughs) I promise. It's not for my gain. That number is 33 with 12 zeros behind it. Imagine if you had 10 stacks of $100 bills that each contained $100 million in it. If you did, you would have $1 billion. Now imagine that you had 10 stacks of bills that each contained $100 billion. If you did, you would have $1 trillion. Now that is a lot of money. Many studies have been done on the mathematical impossibilities of Jesus fulfilling the conservative number of 300 prophecies in an effort to bring the number into a realm that we can even attempt to wrap our minds around. Statisticians use the probability of one man fulfilling only eight specific prophecies. Do you know what that number is? It is 10 to the 17th power where our national debt is 33 with 12 zeros behind it. 10 to the 17th power is the the number 10 with 16 zeros behind it. Let me put it this way. If the Y.O. Lotto was sitting at $10 million right now, and I told you that the next ticket sold at the Maverick on Pershing down here had a 10 to the 17th power chance of winning over losing... (laughs) We would have a stampede in this room right now. <laughs> there would be a traffic jam in the, uh, out here trying to get out of here. The next person, right, to, to Maverick for sure is going to win that $10 million. I love what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, this of the Scriptures. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And Luke chapter 24, verse 44 says this, the resurrected Jesus said to his disciple, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He is that one chance and billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon Upon billions. Beloved, Jesus did not come to destroy the Old Testament. It is the Old Testament that validates his very existence. To get rid of or to unhitch ourselves from it is to unhitch ourselves from Jesus. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the psalmists 
all testify about him. They tell us who Jesus is, and without them, we do not and would not know who he is. The beloved Jesus knew that his disciples would be tempted to think he was abolishing the Old Testament, so he said, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill it. Amen? To fulfill it. Not only would Jesus fulfill the prophecies about his birth, but he would, in fact, fulfill those about his death also. Most notably, Psalm 22, which speaks of the kind of death. And Isaiah 53 adds notes about his burial and his uh, reason for dying. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says this. We're very familiar with the text. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. Unhit yourself from the Old Testament. You have none of those promises. You know nothing of sin. You know nothing of your need for repentance and and forgiveness. Nothing. You see, dear friends, without the Old Testament, we would not understand that God cursed the earth and mankind because of Adam's sin. And without the Old Testament, we would not even understand what sin is. In fact, God gave us the Ten Commandments to function like a mirror. We effectively look at the Ten Commandments and, and the image we see looking back at us is the image of a person who has taken the Lord's name in vain, who has lied, who has stolen, who has coveted, and who has dishonored their parents. Is there anyone in here who hasn't done that? We look at it. We see God's righteous commands and demands of people, and and looking back at us as a sinner, needing saved. And in God's courtroom, any breaking of any of his commandments as grounds for eternal punishment. Unhitch yourself from the Old Testament. You have none of that. That is why we revel in the reality that in Isaiah, God promised that he would send a servant who would be crushed for our sins and cause the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. And here's the good news. Jesus was that servant. He was that servant in the Bible. It was undeniably clear that if you recognize your sin and cry out for mercy, God will cause your sin and your iniquity to fall upon him. What a simple thing. And you will be saved from judgment and God's judgment upon sinners. Dear friends, have you cried out for mercy? You spend any time trying to reach out to people. It's pretty easy for us to say, I like that Jesus loves me. It's easy to accept that, and and anyone would just say, well, in order to not go to hell, I'll accept what Jesus did on the cross. But when you start to press into, are you a sinner? Oh, that's where it gets a little tenuous. Who are you to call me sin? Who is the Bible to call me a sinner? Who is God to judge me? Friends, if you're honest with yourself, you'll, you'll know that in in the presence of a holy God, we are sinners. And God is going to judge us. And he is going to judge justly. Not by the measure of how much good or bad that you think you did, but whether or not you ever sinned. Ever. And we're all guilty. Cry out for mercy. God will will unequivocally Put your sin upon Jesus, and you'll be saved from his coming wrath. Amen? So it is, beloved, that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament about his coming and his dying. However, not everything has been fulfilled. We know that, right? And as we can see in verse 18, all of the unfulfilled prophecies must come to pass. Look there in verse, uh, as Jesus clarifies verse 17 with verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. That's not hard to understand, right? None of anything in the Old Testament will ever pass away until every little bit of what is said back there is 
accomplished. Now, has that happened? No. We have national promises for for Jews. We have promises that all the Jews will be saved. We have a a promise in the Old Testament that is very clear in in Isaiah and other prophets that there will be a time on this earth where where people and bodies just like you and I uh, will still die in the presence of God. It will be like uh, an early death at 100, but they will. Has that happened? No, that's not happened. Why has it not happened? Because not everything has been fulfilled. Not one jot, not one tittle, not the smallest letter, not the smallest stroke will pass from the law until all is accomplished. This is what he's teaching his disciples to teach. We're not getting rid of it. Only a portion of this is done. The rest of it must happen. It's not an option. It's not some mysterious thing that happens and that somehow I've, I've met many. Let me, let, me, let me just take a tangent for just a moment and you can forgive me for keeping you a little bit longer. But, but listen, the popular thing in Christian thinking, Christian circles right now is that Jesus fulfilled everything at his first coming and nothing we should expect uh, that was said has not been fulfilled and therefore somehow spiritually all these things are, are happening There will be no kingdom reign on earth with Christ because Jesus fulfilled it at the cross. Well, it doesn't make any sense in this context. Zero sense. He is teaching his people to tell them what to go and teach. And that is not one jot, not one tittle is kind of the old uh, language for that. The, 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 The NASB is smallest letter or stroke. And if you've done any study in uh, in New Testament or Old Testament languages, you'll know that that jot is a, is a reference to the yod, and the yod is basically like an apostrophe, not the smallest little mark, right? And that tittle or, uh, is, is, is the difference between a calf, which just looks like a C, and, a, and, a, and, and we might think of it as a cursive A, that at the end there's just that little tail, right, on a cursive A. That's that tittle. Not one Detail, not the smallest one, is going to pass away until everything has been completed. Everything. That was my tangent. Now I've probably said things that I was gonna that I wrote. Let's get back to it. (laughs) In verse 18, Jesus reiterates or even explains verse 17. Notice the parallelism between the two. In verse 17, Jesus starts emphatically, do not think. And in verse 18, Jesus starts emphatically, for, I tr- for truly I say to you. In verse 17, Jesus identifies the complication. That is, some thought Jesus had come to abolish the law. But verse 18 answers the complication by saying, until heaven and earth pass away, neither will the law. In the use of the singular, singular word law in verse 18 is a parallel with the law of or the prophets of verse 17. The mention of until all is accomplished signals to us to understand that not just the Torah or the Ten Commandments are in view in that word law. Therefore, that, that word law is to mean the law and the prophets. It's Jesus shortening it up. It is meant to mean the whole Testament. Also, we understand verse 18 is describing verse 17 because the clause in verse 17 Jesus says, because of the clause in verse 17, Jesus says that he did not come to abolish, which is then described in verse 18, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass. Finally, in verse 17, Jesus' statement saying that he came to fulfill is paralleled with the clause until all is accomplished. So beloved, verse 18 is a classic Hebrew parallelism. It's saying it once, and it's saying it again in a different way. We're used to that, right? We know that Hebraic parallelisms are all over uh, in the New Testament, and they are certainly loaded in Proverbs. One example of Proverbs 9.9 is this. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Here comes the parallelism. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase his learning. The moral of the proverb is that both the wise and the righteous are characterized by those who, what? Receive instruction. They say different things. They have different details, but they mean the same thing. They tell us, don't do this or do do this. (laughs) So 
how it is, beloved. Verse 18 explains verse 17. To unhitch or destroy any part of the law or the Old Testament would be antithetical to Jesus' purposes. The smallest details of the Old Testament point to Jesus, and Jesus' life points to the Old Testament and validates its trustworthiness. One cannot exist without the other. There is no such thing as Jesus without sin, without the promise of a fix for that sin. Don't buy into those lies. So the complication was that Jesus understood that his teaching tempted his disciples and likely others to think he was abolishing the Old Testament. However, Jesus rejected that thought and resolved that he came to fulfill it and that all it contains must be accomplished. Here, here it comes as we get ready to, to finish here. There is a warning laden in here. First, uh, first, in verse 19, it starts with whoever. And we have to stop here for just a second and remember who Jesus is speaking to. He is focused, remember, on his disciples who are being trained to go and preach the kingdom of heaven. So think of it that way. Try and put yourself in those seats. He is training these who are going to continue the message, saying, don't do this. <laughs> right? So the whoever is them. Whoever then of the disciples he was training to go and preach uh, whoever one of them annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Notice that Jesus is not saying that someone who annuls or destroys or abolishes from verse 17 will not be in the kingdom of heaven, but rather their reward will be less. We are not talking about entering heaven. We are talking about the rewards of heaven. So I guess... If you're comfortable with having less rewards, you can unhitch yourself from the Old Testament. And you can say that it was all fulfilled in some spiritual way. It's all going to, to, to wake out or work out. I met a guy one time, he'd come through Bible school and he couldn't figure out where he was going to stand with eschatology, so he, took, he called himself a pantheist. It's all going to pan out in the end. Enjoy sweeping those streets. I don't know. You know, that's what I want to say. No, work. Do the work. Dig in. Understand what the text is saying. And what are these commandments that are being referred to here? They are the law or the prophets from verse 17 and the law in verse 18. In effect, these disciples or these new teachers of Jesus, if they want a great reward in heaven, notice in verse 19, they should keep and teach them or these commandments or instructions found in the Old Testament. And why? They should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, beloved, the instructions to keep and to teach uh, the Old Testament do not gain one's entrance, right? Get that in our minds and our hearts. We can look across denominations and we understand that we land on, on different things for different reasons. There's, in fact, every major denomination who has a different view of eschatology is going to come to these very verses and say, well, here's my proof text. It's been one of the most challenging things about studying this particular text is everyone from every camp comes to it and says, look, I'm right. <laughs> it's not about into heaven or out. It is about one's reward when we get there. Amen? I don't know about you, but I would like as much eternal reward as possible. Therefore, I need to understand what it is from the Old Testament. That is, it's wisdom, it's truth about God and knowledge about fulfilled and unfulfilled prophecies, which are still required of me in the New Testament era. I don't ignore them. I don't unhitch from them. I don't destroy them. I will receive reward because of them. <laughs> that is, uh, this is a lifetime of study of the Old and the New Testaments, and that will reveal what has been fulfilled and what has not, what will result in eternal reward and what will not. It's a, it's a careful study recently Dr. Al Mohler, uh, in a podcast, was, 
was, was, was effectively uh, saying that there has been an end to classical dispensationalism. And, and one of the arguments that he makes in, in, that, in that thought process is, is that classic dispensationalism, which kind of mount, measures out seven different dispensations, all this stuff, is too complex. <laughs> Keep it simple. Just be a covenant theologian who just says, everything's under grace. Well, I like that. It simplifies a lot of things. But it surely doesn't answer the questions of the Old Testament. It surely doesn't answer the questions of the prophecy given it. It surely will not stand up and in light of Jesus saying, not one jot, not one tittle won't be fulfilled. You can accept that. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm okay with complex. I'm okay with, let's work it out. This might be a little tough. I'm okay with making a mistake. Maybe I'll look back to this sermon in 10 years and go, man, did I miss that? Maybe I will. It's a lifetime of study. I'll close here by quoting one commentator who noted this, and maybe in your minds and hearts you should be asking this question, right? He says this, quote, This, meaning what I've just taught, does not mean that the New Testament Christian is bound to keep all the Mosaic law commands, since the Old Testament itself, track here, predicted that the New Covenant would supersede the Mosaic Covenant. Are you with me? <laughs> not everything is going to be required of us in the Mosaic Covenant. Why? The very, the very Old Testament teaches that the Mosaic Covenant would pass away. So we do the work, we look back, we ask what has been fulfilled, what has not been fulfilled, what is required, what is not required. Those are not always easy answers. Amen? He then referenced Jeremiah 31, the prediction of the new covenant. I couldn't help but think of Deuteronomy 18 and the prediction of a prophet like Moses who would come. Hebrews chapter 8 through 10, which calls the Mosaic Covenant obsolete. We've got to think our way through those things. 11. The Apostle Paul wrote young Timothy in an era when the New Testament scriptures or teachings of Jesus uh, were, were still being written, teaching him this about the Old Testament. Have you ever paused? We always read ourselves back into these texts, right? Here we are. <laughs> we had the whole Bible. And we read that back into what Timothy was hearing. Timothy is not hearing the New Testament in this instruction from Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, all Scripture, I'll have it here for you on the screen. All Scripture. Stop for just a second. What Scripture is Paul talking about to Timothy? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. They have not been put together. They might be floating around in a letter. If it's early enough, right? And it likely is. Second Timothy is a late letter, right? But it's not been all drugged together. Not every, not every synagogue or church is going, to, is going to have every letter. But what is he referring to here? Yes, it could, could, could be some of the New Testament scriptures, right? But all of it, that is the old, right, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Love it, don't detach from the Old Testament. There's so much to be learned. What would we know about the character of God in, in, in his judgment, in his truth-telling and truth-keeping nature without the Old Testament? Would we be able to trust if we can just get rid of the Old Testament, if we, if we unhitch ourselves from it, and we, we, wouldn't, we would miss and lose even the, the prophecies about the new heaven and the, and the new earth found in Isaiah. We would not won't know even what to look forward to. Scriptures are inspired by God. Beloved Jesus, as we close here, thank you for your patience. Understood his life and teaching would cause confusion that... that um, that it would tempt his disciples to think he was abolishing the Old Testament. However, he rejected that thought and affirmed that he came to fulfill it and that everything it contains must come to pass. 
affirming that those who obeyed and taught the Old Testament would have the greater reward in heaven. Are you a student of God's word? I really encourage you. Fall in love with your Bible, amen? Eternal rewards are at stake. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for these folks who have come and 